Thanks for turning on my video. I'm turning off my share first. Uh, Great. Yeah, in just uh, a second. And you should be able now to share. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Great. Uh, one second. Cool. Okay, great. Um, it's great to be here. And I mean, I, I have a, a very soft spot, obviously, for the any of these Indaba X events, being one of the founders of the, the main Indaba. And um, it's been really exciting to see how the different communities have grown, particularly Uganda. Um, and it's an honor to be able to talk to you all today. Um, yeah, it's, this, is, this is one of the subjects that I'm most passionate about, and I'm excited that I can share this with you as well. Um, so yeah, let, let's dive into this. Also, um, if anyone has any questions along the way, please feel free to ask. Um, I might not be able to see it, so in, that, in which case, I hope someone can, can flag that to me while I'm talking, but I, I'm happy for this to be quite interactive. So, yes, um, I'm Benjamin Rosman, or Benji, I'm a professor at the University of the Witwatersrand, and <clears throat> yeah, reinforcement learning is really what I'm passionate about. And wh what that's all about is decision making. And to me, this is the core question or you know, core area that we should be excited about in artificial intelligence. To me, this really is artificial intelligence. So if we want to make decisions in an, in an uncertain world, what does this mean? Well, to some extent, you can think of this as the areas of machine learning that are required to be able to get robots to work. And I'll explain this to you throughout the talk, why this is really the question of doing things rather than just learning things. Now, you could think of decision making in a number of different ways, but I think a lot of machine learning actually at its core is about decision making. Right, so whenever you're doing classification, you're doing some sort of decision making, you're seeing a new data point and you're deciding, does it belong to one class or another? So given an image, is this a cat or a dog? Um, given some economic time series data or financial time series data, will the markets go up or down, right? That's a decision we're making. And there's a lot of really beautiful tools that we can use to do this from a whole lot of different toolboxes. And by now you should be familiar with some of these. So most commonly there's <clears throat> the family of decision trees, which gives us particularly interpretable rules for our decision. So these would be effectively asking a, a set of if then statements um, to give us a decision. You've got classical methods like logistic regression, which um, you know take a set of inputs, which could be continuous, and we'll learn some sort of decision boundary um, to decide if something's in one class or another. It can obviously be scaled to deal with multiple different classes. Uh, random forests are an extension to decision trees that are possibly one of the most commonly used methods for classification. They're lightweight, they're efficient, they don't need a huge amount of data, and they're used all over industry. Again, trying to classify something into classes. You've got things like nearest neighbors, which work more in a non-parametric sense to say one data point is in some space um, very close to other data points where we know what the labels are, and so we can infer the label from that. You've got the kind of Bayesian methods like naive Bayes, which um, are about learning probabilities. You've got support of vector machines as a kind of extension to logistic regression that allows you to choose the best decision boundary as in the one that's furthest from your data points. You've got probabilistic graphical models that are um, extensions to naive Bayes and allow you to make much more complicated probabilistic um, 
statements about your data and let you bake in priors and your beliefs of what you expect to be happening. And then, of course, these days, what's most really the, the kind of tool everybody's excited about is neural networks. And this is your deep learning. This is your extension to logistic regression, having multiple layers, which allows you to learn kind of different representations of your data to make it easier to classify. So all of these different toolboxes here are about decision making. But it's a certain kind of decision. It's about deciding, is this A or B? Now, what happens if we think about a case? I mentioned robots earlier. Let's say we had a robot in a factory. So we've got this humanoid robot, this robot with a human form that might be able to walk around this factory floor and do things. Now, how is this different to that classification problem? Well, there's a few aspects that make it different. Firstly, we've got long sequences of actions. So we don't just want to make a certain decision, is this a, a hammer or is this a screwdriver? We want it to decide, you know, we, we'd like our robot to walk across the floor. What does it have to do then? It's going to make the sequence of decisions, which might be put your left foot there, then your right foot there, then your left foot here, your right foot there, bend down, pick this up, and so on. So again, a long sequence of actions, which is different to the supervised learning case. Then there's causal dependencies, which is very interesting. What this means is that what I do next or the decision I make next depends on what I've done before. Now, in, in most of machine learning, certainly in supervised learning, we typically make this assumption that our data is IID, independent and identically distributed. All right, so what does this mean? This means that if I am processing one data point, um, that doesn't affect the next data point that I process. But if you think about this case of this robot moving around this warehouse, um, right, the, the action that it takes, let's say it opens a door, that might only be possible because it walked up to the door. Every time it does something, it changes either itself or the environment. Like it moves, it moves its X, Y position, it moves the joints in its arms, it changes something in the factory, it could be opening a door, picking something up. So everything it does has some effect, which means that we have to take that into account for future actions. And then finally, the other very important difference is that there's very sparse feedback. Now, if you think about supervised learning, Every point that you see, you get some feedback. So when you're training, you've got a, a data set and for each data point, you've got a label. You know that it was a cat or a dog. But when our robot's walking around the factory, it might have a goal of open a door or pick something up. Now, every time it moves its arms or legs, takes another step, it gets no feedback. We don't know if it's done the right thing or the wrong thing. We only care about some goal that it might get to in a two minutes time. So it's not getting feedback at every single time step as we're used to in machine learning. It's this delayed sense where I do a bunch of stuff and then I get feedback. And based on that, we want to learn what to do. So this seems quite a difficult problem. And while it's got similarities to supervised learning, it's clearly got these features that make it very different. Now, this is the realm of reinforcement learning. This shouldn't be a surprise. I've mentioned this already. Um, and reinforcement learning specifically is the branch of machine learning related to learning in these sequential decision making settings, in these settings where we've got to make a sequence of decisions rather than just one. And we can also think about reinforcement learning as behavior learning. Why? Because we've got to make multiple decisions where we care about the long term effects. Right? We want to learn a behavior for getting to the door of the factory or a behavior for walking or making coffee or playing chess or something like that. Now, for any of you with a bit of an engineering background, what we're actually talking about here is stochastic optimal control theory with unknown models. Stochastic optimal control theory um, has its roots in applied mathematics and electrical engineering. And that's to do with how to choose the optimal action um, when you've got a model of how the world works. So typically this would happen where you've got, let's say, a chemical production uh, plant um, and you want to choose exactly how, many, how much of each substance you want to allow into, say, a mixing tank. Um, th 
Optimal control theory allows you to compute the best thing to do. But typically, you need to know exactly what you want to achieve. You need to know exactly how the chemical processes work and so on. But when we've got a robot work, walking around a factory, we don't know all of this. We don't know how the, the exact physics of the interactions between different parts of the robot or the robot and the factory work. So we've got to do some learning before we can figure out what the right thing to do is. Now, let, let's look a little bit at the details of what goes on here. Now, we're going to model this as an idea of a decision maker, which we call an agent that exists in its environment. So we've got our robot, which is our decision maker, and the environment might be the factory. Now, actually, that's a bit of a, a I, I've, I've brushed a few details under the rug here because what we want to think about as the environment is every bit of information that's useful for the agent to make its decisions. So if the agent is our robot, it might be able to put one foot down, put another foot down. Maybe it can only move its joint angles and we've still got to learn how to put feet down. Maybe it's got higher level actions that let it open doors or pick things up. It's got some set of actions available to it. But the environment is everything that it's going to use to make those decisions. So this could be, is the door open or closed? This could be um, where are different objects lying in the factory? But it could also be things about the robot itself. It could be what are its current joint angles? What are its XY positions? Which direction is it facing? Is it holding something and so on? So we think about the environment as all the information we need to make our decisions. Then we've got this kind of interactive loop where our agent takes actions. And as I've implied, it does this based on the state of the environment. So the state is the current set of values um, of everything in the environment. Once it does that, the environment state changes. So for example, if I pick something up, I'm now holding something in my hand. If I push the door closed, the door is now closed. If I take a step forward, maybe my X, Y coordinates have changed. So there's a change in state that goes back to the agent. But also I might receive some feedback, which is some reward. We'll talk about reward a little bit later, but the idea is that this codifies things that are good or bad. So it might tell me something good has happened or something bad has happened. Now the reinforcement learning paradigm is the cycle, this interactive cycle between an agent and an environment. Now, obviously this is still not abstract enough. We need to go mathematical. And so the model we typically use to describe this kind of problem um, is what's called a Markov decision process. Now, this is a, a mathematical structure that lets us encode everything we care about in the problem. There's a few different ways you can formulate an MDP, as these are called. Um, but the, the main idea of it is that it's this tuple of a few elements. So first, we have a set of states. These are the green circles in this diagram. And these are all the possible encodings of the world. So every possible configuration of what the world might look like. So in this case, the world could be in one of three different states, S0, S1, or 2. Um, obviously, this is much smaller than you'd be working with in any real problem. But this kind of encapsulates what you care about. You've then got actions. And you could have a whole a huge number of actions. They could be continuous. They could be discrete. In this case, what we've got is for each of the three states, there's two actions that can be taken by our decision maker. It can choose A0 or A1. And the way this is set up, which is quite commonly done, is you can execute all of them, um, any of them in any state. Then we've got what's called a transition function. And this tells you how the world evolves. So for example, if I'm in state S2, um, I'm going to try and use a laser pointer. I hope you can see this. Um, if I'm in state S2, and I choose the action A0. So this red arrow refers to a choice I can make because I could have also chosen A1. Then what this says is with probability one, the world will transition to state S0. But these can be stochastic. So if I'm in S0 and I choose action A0, I might stay in S0 with probability 0.7, um, or I might move to S2 with some probability. So the idea is, 
that this encodes all of the transitions in the world. So if the world looks like something in a current state and I take a certain action, there's some probability distribution of what's going to happen next. Now, what's important to note here is these are called Markov decision processes. What does this mean? Well, this is a decision process. So as I, my, my robot or my agent could exist on this graph forever, potentially, just keep moving around it, choosing actions based on what state it is in. But so, so that makes it a Markov, uh, sorry, that makes it a decision process. What makes it Markov is that these transitions only depend on my current state and never on my history. So if I'm in state S0 and choose A0, the outcomes of this don't depend on where I was previously before S0, they just depend on the fact that I was in S0. That's what makes it Markov. Then the final core ingredient of an MDP is the reward function. Um, and what this does is this says on some of these transitions, I could get some feedback, some positive or negative feedback, but note that this doesn't have to be everywhere. And this was this idea I gave you earlier about sparse rewards. There might only be one transition that gives you rewards here and the rest maybe don't. And again, the idea is that our agent could live on this graph forever and keep moving around between states and so on. And it was, it's going to accumulate positive and negative rewards as it does that. So that's the model. That's how we're going to describe the setup that the agent lives in mathematically and how it makes its and the effects of its decisions. Okay, so now we know what the world looks like. What about what the agent's actually going to do? Now, these are what we call a policy. So a policy, which we usually denote by pi, and you could also think of as a behavior or a strategy, is any mapping from states to actions. So one policy could be in that previous figure could be always choose action A0. That's a policy. Another policy could be if you're in S0, choose action A0 with probability 0.2. If you're in S1, choose action A0 with probability 1, and so on. So it's any mapping from states to actions. And that tells you how is your agent going to behave in this situation? If we give it this problem, how will it behave? And as I said, these can be deterministic or stochastic. But what we really want to learn is the optimal policy. And what is the optimal policy? It's the policy that gives us the maximal rewards as we're moving in this MDP. So in a way, this is the whole goal of reinforcement learning, is given some MDP, which describes some complicated scenario, can we learn the optimal policy that lets us accumulate the maximal rewards? Let's look at an example. So let's say we've got this little cleaning robot over here. Um, that exists in this in this world of 12 cells. And the way this is going to work is this is the state space. So everything we need to know about the world can be described by which of these cells is the robot sitting in. It's got actions that will move at one cell north, south, east, or west. So those are the four actions it can choose. Um, I'm going to encode this cell just to make it interesting as an obstacle, so it can't move here. And then we can, so we, we've defined the states, we've defined the actions, the transitions are, are clear. If I'm here and I move up, if I choose the up action, I'll move to this cell. But if I choose the left action from here, nothing will happen. And finally, the reward function, which tells us what we want to do might be if I find this dirt over here, I get a reward of one. Maybe I could fall into this hole and get a reward of minus one. And maybe I'm going to get a tiny little negative reward for every move that I make. And that's just to try and get it to solve the task efficiently and not waste time. Now, this is going to be the, the, the task here is to maximize reward. So based on this reward description, what I want to do is find the dirt, not fall into the hole, and use as few moves as possible because that's how I get the maximum reward. And we're also going to think of this as an episodic task, which means the robot's going to get multiple tries at solving the task. Now, if we needed to get the optimal policy, we'd expect this to look something like that, which would be these arrows tell you what the optimal action could be in any state. So this is what the goal of our process would be, would be to try and learn 
a function that looks like this to solve the task. This is solving the task, actually. Now, if we want to get to the optimal policy, what we need to do is be able to evaluate different trajectories. So we need to be able to say, if I've got two candidates, um, which is the best one? Now, this is quite straightforward because we can just look at the total rewards accumulated along the trajectory. What does this mean when we say, so I've got here discounted accumulated rewards. So the accumulated rewards is just the sum of all the rewards you get along the trajectory. And the discounting is a notion we don't always use, but it kind of says that a reward, an immediate reward might be worth more to me than a future reward. So if I've got two different trajectories, which could have come from two different policies, I can evaluate them. I can say, okay, one of these trajectories got me a reward of 42 and another one of minus 18 and another one of 37.6 by accumulating the rewards along the trajectory. And I can use that to choose which is the best one, right? That's a, a nice intuitive idea here. Okay, so if I've got that, what can I do with it? Well, first let's just stop and talk a little bit more about rewards. Okay, the, this is clearly a key element of our problem because it's the thing that we're trying to maximize. So what is the reward? Well, firstly, what's important is that it's a feedback signal, but it's also scalar. So in supervised learning, you'd be looking at a reward as being one of your, or your, your feedback as being your class label, being one of your classes, or it could be some sort of number that you um, doing with regression. But here we think of this as this feedback signal that's scalar, just telling you something good happened or something bad happened. And this can be anything, right? So you might have a case where your award just tells you you were playing a game and you won or you lost. Um, maybe it can tell you you took collisions, uh, you bumped into things. Uh, maybe it can tell you you've taken expensive actions in a similar way to in that previous example, we had the reward of negative 0.001 every time I took an action, right? So it's encoding good and bad things that happen in our environment. But again, you'd expect that in most cases, um, most transitions aren't going to give you feedback. It's kind of based on this idea of psycho from psychology of like the carrot and the stick, right? Your, your um, positive rewards are like these incentives for your agent, like try and get these, but your negative rewards are kind of like punishments that it's trying to avoid. So it's got to learn about these things um, as it's interacting in this environment. And as we, I've said before, what's important is these rewards are sparse, um, they're delayed, and actually also their, their value is typically relative. So you can scale all of them together, that doesn't really matter. It's just really encoding that one thing is 10 times more desirable than another thing. Now, this seems clear, right? We can just set up a bunch of rewards that of things we do and don't want, and then our agent should be able to learn to solve the problem. But it's actually not that straightforward. And there's a lot of problems that can come in if you're not careful putting your reward function together. One of the stories I like to tell that um, I, I think exemplifies this quite well is the problem of the rats of Hanoi. So this was in Hanoi in the early 1900s when it was still under colonial rule. Um, they had a problem in the, in the city and that was that they had this rat infestation. So they had more rats than they knew what to do with and the government needed a solution. Um, now, it, it was such a bad problem that they figured they can't just get a bunch of exterminators to go around, it's just the scale is too big. So this was one of the early examples of crowdsourcing. So what they did is they said, okay, we want the population to take care of these rats, that makes the most sense, there's people everywhere. So let's reward them. So for anyone who kills a rat, we're going to give them some amount of money. Now. Obviously, we need some proof because we can't just um, take someone's word for it. Um, but we also don't want them bringing dead rats to government offices because that's not fantastic for hygiene and things. 
So what we'll do is we'll take as proof of killing, having killed a rat that they'll arrive with a tail of the rat. So if you bring us a rat tail, we'll give you some money. So that sounds good. This is an incentive scheme to get people to kill as many rats as possible. Now, the problem was that over time, they noticed that there wasn't a decrease in the number of rats in the city. In fact, there was an increase. Uh, it's weird. And they noticed another weird thing. A lot of rats were running around without tails. Because it turns out under these constraints, the optimal thing to do is to breed rats and just cut off their tails. If you kill them, you can't breed them, which means you can't chop off their tails and make money out of it. So people basically set up these rat farms and were just handing in the tails. Now, this is an example of how a, a reward function that might make a lot of sense actually there's different ways you can exploit it. Now, more practically in the area of robots and machine learning, you know, you could imagine a case of a self-driving car. And, you know, it might be clear that what we wanted to do is take us from A to B, but that isn't actually what we wanted to do. So if we just gave it that function and asked it to optimize, it's not gonna do what we want. What we really want is take us from A to B, um, but do it as quickly as possible, but also do it fuel efficiently, but also don't break the rules of the road, preferably don't kill anyone, don't speed, don't drive off the road into buildings or across fields and things like that. So there, there's often a lot that we don't explicitly describe in the problem, um, which we really care about. Now, this is important because obviously if we said, um, you know, our main concern is to do this as fuel efficiently as possible, the vehicle is not going to move, right? Because that's pretty fuel efficient. But if instead our constraint is just get there as soon as possible, it's just going to drive off road and do whatever. So it's important to think about these considerations with your rewards. Now, the other important thing is that because rewards aren't being given to you all the time, you can't just act with respect to your immediate reward. I can't just look at um, my current state of the world and say, if I do one thing, I'll get some reward. And if I do another thing, I'll get a different reward. So let me just choose the one that gives me the biggest reward. And what we call that is we, we can't act myopically or we can't act greedily. And, and here's an example of why. Let's say we've got our robot over here. And if it moves one step to the left, then the task ends and it gets a little bit of money. But if it moves five steps to the right, the task ends and it gets a lot of money. So if we were just trying to act greedily and decide what to do next, we'd say one step this way gives me some money, one step this way gives me nothing, so I should go to the left, which would be suboptimal. Now, this is actually difficult to deal with even for people, right? We tend to not act optimally um, over the long term which is interesting, our brains don't really work like that. We hack it sometimes. So we've come up with societal hacks that help us get around this problem. And I think there, there's two examples of this. The one is going to school. There's no immediate value in going to school, right? It's annoying, nobody wants to do that when they're a kid, it might cost you a lot of money and so on. But we've accepted as a society that if you do this for a number of years, it puts you in a much better position for the long term. Similarly, going to gym, like going to gym is annoying. You might have to wake up early. It's irritating. It's smelly. There's, I don't know, nobody wants to run on a treadmill for hours, but we do that because we know there's long-term benefits. So there are these few <clears throat> situations where we've kind of hacked this, but in general, humans are bad at this decision-making. We tend to favor the short-term rewards. And you can see why, because it's difficult to think about the long-term. There's probabilities of what's gonna happen. It's not completely clear where you'll end up and so on. And so reasoning about this is difficult. So, and similarly, it's difficult for our artificial agents. So the point is we can't just rely on the reward function to choose what we do next. We need something in the middle. And what we do is we want to define something which is the value of how good a state is if we take the future into account. So what we want to do is we want to say that in this case, based on the immediate reward, one step left is better than one step right, 
But if we consider the future, then one step right should be better than the one step left. And we, we call this the value of a state. And we represent it by something called a value function. So what is a value function? Well, we, we talk about the value of a state under a policy. So it's important to know what this policy is, because that tells you what's going to happen in the future. And the question a value function really asks is how good is our state under the policy of what's going to happen in the future? So this is an encoding of the expected reward, how much reward I expect to receive if I start in the state S and then I follow the policy pi all the way into the future. Like how much reward do I expect to get? So let's look at an example. So maybe the we've got this world over here where we've got this agent, which is this green circle, trying to get to this yellow star. And maybe when it gets to the yellow star, it's going to get a reward of 100. But that's the only reward it's going to get. Now, if we looked at a trajectory, so let's say that our agent had just walked randomly around the world. Okay, it got no reward anywhere except when it got to the end. It got a reward of 100. What we want is we want a value function to encode something about the proximity to 100. So let's just say maybe it was getting a small negative reward, maybe minus one for every step that it took. That's not an informative signal. But what it tells us is that if we're one step away, actually that state was worth 99. And two steps away, maybe that state was worth 98 and so on. So the idea is we need some sort of encoding which is our value function that tells us how good is a state based on what I know I was going to do in the future. Okay, let's, let's look at another example. Let's say we've got this little world over here. So again, it's a, it's a grid world. So it's a five by five grid world, but every action that I take is gonna give me minus one. Unless I get to the state A, I'm gonna get immediately teleported to A prime and get a reward of 10. Or if I go to B, I'm going to get teleported to B prime and get a reward of five. There's a bit of an arbitrary world, but let's say that was the world. Now, what would the value function look like? Well, the optimal value function looks something like this. Now, you can imagine that we could compute magically the, the optimal policy, which would look like this, which should be quite intuitive. If I'm here, I can either go up or to the right. So I could just carry on going up and over there. Um, this is what the optimal policy would look like. But the optimal value function looks something like this. We've got the highest reward over here. And as we move away from it, we get slightly decreased rewards. So you can think of the brightest area as giving you as having the highest value. Um, the darkest area is the lowest value. And this gives you an idea of the value of a state. Whereas we only really got value, we only really got reward if we're in state A or B before we could compute this for the entire map. Now, what's interesting is if you have the optimal value function, we get for free the optimal policy because the optimal value function is designed in such a way that if we act greedily on it, we get the optimal policy. So if it is telling us the, the exact um, optimal values of each state, we just need to act greedily. So if I was in this state, for example, I just go towards the next best value. Turns out in this case, these two are equal. And that tells you what direction to take here. So if I can get this optimal value function, for free, I get the optimal policy. Now, if you knew how the transitions work and what the reward was. So if we had this agent that had to solve this problem and it knew exactly how the transitions worked, and it knew exactly where it got the rewards, then I can compute the optimal policy or the optimal value function, right? How do you do that? Well, basically through dynamic programming. This is what optimal control theory would do. And um, we can do this through dynamic programming. Um, we can just compute the value. So we can iterate backwards, right? So the value of this state depends on the value of all its neighboring states. And we can compute this as a nice recursive function. Because we know what states are nearby, we know what rewards it would receive, we can just compute this offline. We don't have to do any learning. Okay, so again, if we know everything about the problem, if we know exactly how the dynamics, which is the physics of the problem works, 
we know exactly what the de desirable states are, we can just compute the optimal policy. That's not difficult. Again, that's just dynamic programming. However, generally in reinforcement learning, we make this assumption that our transition and reward functions aren't known. Now, why would we do this? If we've got a robot walking around a factory, the physics of how it moves are going to be incredibly complicated. And it's unlikely we'd have a nice expression for that, and particularly for things like what happens if it bumps into objects? Where are the objects? How are they working? What happens if it's interacting with a human? We can't have the physics models of all of this. And similarly, we don't always know exactly what's what's desirable. We usually know what the good outcomes are, but we don't want to enumerate every single thing to compute this through a, a kind of closed form or um, recursive solution. So typically, when we do reinforcement learning, we assume that these models aren't known. And that's kind of the basis for what we're doing. And this is why we need to learn. So if we don't know the kind of underlying physics of our problem, instead, what we have to do is generate data. So this is where kind of the machine learning comes in. So we've spoken about the, the kind of control, the optimization of if I know everything, I can, I can solve and get a policy. But now I've got to actually learn the components so that I can get that policy. So what we do instead is we generate training data. And training data takes this form. We're going to say, I was in some state. I took some action. I received some reward. And the world transitioned to a new state. And we're going to kind of take those as samples from the environment. So if we had our little agent in a maze, we might say the state is the position the agent's in. And the action was that he moved up. There was a new state, he moved over there, and maybe he got a reward of zero. So that's going to be one of these two pulls that I want to learn from. I could get other ones, you know, maybe he's over here, he tries to move up. Um, that's not allowed by the world. So if, if it was actually walking around the world, it tries to move up, nothing happens. Um, so we know the state stays the same, but maybe I get a reward of minus five. So the idea is, if we can collect this data, we can learn what to do in the environment. But there's two things that we need to be able to solve this problem. Firstly, we need a way to choose these actions. Like, how in these examples did I choose to go up? Right? Was that a good thing to do? We need a way to choose the actions, but we also need something to keep track of what we're doing and learn. And it turns out we've already got that. That's the value function. So let's focus on this question of how do we choose actions. Now, this is an interesting problem. This is a kind of subset of reinforcement learning, and it's called the bandit problem. So imagine you walk into a casino and you're faced with all these different machines. And we talk about this as a multi-arm bandit problem because traditionally these machines are called one-arm bandits. Um, and the idea is, if you've got, let's say, these five machines in front of you, we've got a choice problem here. So each one of these machines is an action. Um, so I could choose to play machine one, two, three, four, or five. Now, what's the optimal strategy here? Um, like, how should you deal with the situation? Well, the, the kind of mechanics of what we assume is going on here is that each machine gives you a payout or a reward according to some distribution, but we don't know what those distributions are. So what we want to do is learn to maximize the payoffs that we get. And how do we do this? We do this by finding the best machine. Okay, but the payoffs they give us are stochastic. So if I play one of the machines, and I get $10. Now I've got some questions to ask. One, is $10 representative of this machine? Or did I get very lucky on this one? Or similarly, did I get very unlucky? Maybe that's like the worst thing I'm going to see here, but it could also be the best thing I'm going to see here. So this is a difficult problem because we don't actually know what's going to give us the best reward. And there's a few things we might think about. One, could we try the best thing we've seen before? So maybe, that $10 from the one machine was the best thing we've seen before. 
But maybe we should try something new. Maybe there's a machine we've never tried or we've only tried once. So we don't know if the $1 we got from that is representative of this. Now, this is an important trade-off in reinforcement learning and in fact, in decision-making in general. And this is called the exploration exploitation trade-off. The idea here is that if you want to maximize the rewards that you get, you've got to balance between these two components. The first is exploitation. And this says, can I act greedily with respect to what I know already? So if I've already got some knowledge, can I exploit that? Can I take the best thing that I've seen before? But at the same time, I need to think about exploration, which is, can I act randomly and try something new? Because I assume I don't know everything that I care about about the problem. Now, there's a lot of ways that we think about this trade-off in reinforcement learning, but the most common is what's called epsilon greedy. So this is for some value of epsilon between zero and one, we balance these two concepts. So typically with probability one minus epsilon, we exploit. So we choose the best action. So this would be in that casino situation with probability one minus epsilon, we choose the best machine um, every time we want to play a machine, we choose the best one we've ever seen before. But with probability epsilon, we choose one randomly at um, we choose an action at random. And the idea here is that if we're going to be in the situation multiple times, we're going to play a machine 10 times or 100 times, some percentage of the time determined by epsilon, we're going to explore, choose one at random. And that gives us more information so that when we exploit, um, we've got better information to choose from. And typically in reinforcement learning or in the band problems, we start with epsilon higher at the beginning of learning, which means when we don't know anything, we're going to explore more. And over time, we start exploiting more. So if we do this, um, as we're moving around our environment, what this means is at the beginning, our agent's going to choose actions at random. But over time, it's going to start exploiting. It's going to start choosing the ones that it's got a better idea of their value. Okay, so that's how we choose actions. Then we need a way to keep track of what we've done. And this we can do with the value function. So the value function can just tell us based on what we've done so far or seen so far, this is how good we think a state will be in the future. And it turns out these are the two components we need to actually start solving these problems. Now, there's a whole lot of different kinds of methods and a whole lot of different methods themselves. But the, probably the most foundational concept um, of learning in reinforcement learning is what we call temporal difference learning. And I'll go through conceptually what that means here. But more algorithms in RL are based on this concept than anything else. And in fact, there's even been evidence that the brain does some learning in this kind of way, which is really interesting. I think it's a fascinating area of research to look at these comparisons to human decision making. So the basic idea of TD or temporal difference learning is to follow this kind of loop. So what we do is we keep repeating this process. Now, there's going to be two loops here. And as I mentioned earlier, you've got this idea of an episodic task. I'm going to try this many, many times. So I'm going to have my agent over here walk through the maze many, many times or try things. Um, and over time, it's going to get better at solving the problem. So for each episode, we start in a certain place. So we pick a start state, and that might be where it starts in the maze, for example. Um, and we've got a current estimate of the value. Right at the beginning, this might just be initialized to zero, for example, but it's got a current estimate of value. Then we kind of play the game. We move through the maze, usually until we hit some sort of win or lose condition, or the thing times out. We might only let it have 100 steps, um, and then it times out and starts again, and that will take it back to the outer loop. Now, the way this inner loop works is at each point, we're going to choose an action um, using our policy. So maybe in this state, we've got three actions available to us, and we're going to choose some action. Now, if we have a policy, derived from our value function, then maybe we can exploit it, or we might pick randomly and explore. So using that exploration exploitation idea, we're going to choose one of the actions from the state. We're then going to take that action. So we've chosen this one, we're going to take it, 
and that moves the environment like we physically moved in the environment to a new state and we see what state we ended up in and the reward that we got now this is actually the tuple we spoke about earlier s a s prime and r these are the four things we need to learn and what we do here is there's an update that we make to the value of this initial state based on the value of the state we went to and the reward. What is the idea here? The reward is what we received immediately, which again, for most states might be nothing, but we also update this value based on what we saw happen at this state. So if this value over here at S prime is an, expect, is an estimate of the expected value of what might happen in the future from S prime, we're kind of propagating that value back to this one. So we're gonna update this value based on what happened next. And that's the basic idea of learning here. And then, of course, now our agent has moved to S prime and we repeat the process from S prime. This is fundamentally how learning and reinforcement learning works at the most basic level. I think what, what's important to see here is that we do our learning while we're acting. So we're updating this value function while we're moving around the environment. And so the more time we spend in the environment, the better we are at dealing with that environment because we've learned more about it. We're kind of propagating these values around to see what could happen in the future. Cool. So with that in mind, what does learning look like? Well, we typically see this kind of learning curve, which says in your early episodes, we're acting badly. But over time, we start improving our performance, and then we finally converge, hopefully, to the optimal value. And so over multiple episodes in a problem, you'd expect that your reward will increase until it saturates. Okay, so this gives us a basic idea of how to learn in these kinds of problems. But now for any problem we really care about in general, the world is continuous, right? So I can't just keep this value for every state if I'm working based on a camera that's maybe fitted to the front of my car, because every state may be a combination of these pixels. So there's a couple of problems there. One, I'm unlikely to see every state, and I'm also unlikely to see every state more than once. So I can't just keep updating the same, like have a value for every state because it's going to be a huge space, like all possible pixel combinations is just ridiculous, it's exponential, um, and I'm not going to sample these things. So the number of data samples is going to be sparse um, in the size of the space. And I'd have a similar problem with a robot. It might have a camera, so I'd have the same problem here, but it could also have continuous joints in its arms. So this might give us like a 10 or 14 dimensional continuous space. Again, I'm unlikely to see all of those. So what do I do in this case when I can't just have a, a value associated with each discrete state because they're continuous or there's an exponential number of them? So instead what we do is we bring in this idea of function approximation. So instead of trying to learn the best action for every state, what we can use is other ideas from machine learning. And most commonly these days is we use a neural network. And our neural network is used to learn a representation of this value function. So we're not explicitly storing a value for every state. Instead, we've got a neural network that lets us map from states to our value function, to our values or even our actions. There's different setups for this. So I could have a complicated neural network and that basically approximates the value function based on the samples I've received. And the super cool thing here is that I can bring all of supervised learning now into reinforcement learning. And specifically, I can bring all of deep learning. You know, there's a zillion things that happen in deep learning every day. And I can just bring the latest developments in that field to improve my reinforcement learning. That's awesome. So the whole deep learning craze has been going on for the last decade and a half or so. But actually, this has a much longer history. So this idea of using um, this function approximation, particularly through neural networks in reinforcement learning, goes back a long way. And most famously, there was this really nice example from Jerry Tesoro in the early 90s called TD Gammon. So he used this idea of um, the temporal difference learning combined with a very simple neural network to learn to play this game, which is backgammon. This is a game that has been played by humans for ages. And the question was, can you use reinforcement learning to learn to play this game? 
And the answer was yes. So this learned from about one and a half million games. Um, there was a simple um, neural network because the problem was that the number of board configurations is huge. It's like 10 to the 20. And so you could never enumerate all of those. But with a simple reward function of just getting one for a win and minus one for a loss, this could learn over one and a half million games to play at the level of best humans. And in fact, people still use strategies that came out of this algorithm um, in their own play. But that was old. So now there's been a, a lot of progress in this direction. And often in reinforcement learning, we look at playing games. And the reason for this is we need this kind of simulation environment. We need to be able to choose actions, maybe play a million games to gather the data to learn from. Now, there's areas in reinforcement learning that try and get around this problem, but it's still one of the challenges of the field. So we typically use things where we've got simulators, we use robots, we use games, because we can play this number of games. So more recently, people have been trying to play more sophisticated games. And famously, the, the big technique that led to breakthroughs in this area came out of DeepMind in about 20, between 2013 and 15. And this was this idea of a deep Q network, which is fundamentally just a slightly more sophisticated version of the exact same thing. <clears throat> We're basically doing TD learning, but combining it with like a fancy neural network. It's not even that fancy. It's just a convolutional neural network. And the idea was just to learn the values of different states and actions. But this had a really big, important impact on the field. And the field grew from a very small niche field. There, there weren't that many of us working in RL to a huge thing everyone's excited about. And I want to just show you a demo of how this works on a very simple game called Breakout. So this came out of DeepMind. This was demonstrating how this worked. Um, and the idea here is we're going to basically do what we've been talking about. So we've got an agent. It doesn't understand anything about the game. All it knows is it can move the, the paddle. So it can move left or right. And it's going to see what happens on the screen. It's just getting feedback from the screen. So the point of this game is to try and delete all those blocks at the top. You get points for that. Um, and bounce it with the paddle at the bottom. And you can see at the beginning of learning, this is just moving randomly. It's doing terribly. This is where it's exploring. It's trying to learn more about the environment. But over time, as it collects more and more data, it gets better. So it says here, this is after two hours of training. Admittedly, this is on like Google level compute. So it normally takes longer. But you can see here, it's actually learned the policy to play the game, right? It can move the paddle in the right way to bounce the ball to actually play the game like a human. Now, that's super cool. But what's even more interesting is if you just leave it for training for longer, it, it gets even better at optimizing the um, the reward function. So you can see here, it learns these kind of tricks that make the game easier. But it's clear that it's actually learned the dynamics of the game. It's learned how the point system works. Um, it's learned a lot about what's happening here because it can actually play this at a human level. And you can see here, it's got the strategy that humans, like the best humans will use um, to, to play the game. Now, what was super important about this result is you could use the exact same algorithm to play a whole lot of different games. And in fact, you can play 50 something games on this Atari suite. Well, this is what this first paper showed with the exact same algorithm, which shows that it's pretty general. Um, and in fact, um, this was a result from the initial paper that showed like all the games above this line, the exact same algorithm could play at human level. And subsequently, we've pushed this down and probably most of these we can play at human level now. Again, just using these concepts that we've been talking about today. OK, but these are just video games. Can we do more sophisticated things? Well, this is Go, which was considered for decades to be a grand challenge of artificial intelligence, particularly once chess was considered solved. So Go is an ancient Chinese board game. It's actually very simple to play. You just take turns placing a white or black stone. But it's very difficult. It's considered to be the thing that like chess players will graduate to when they get bored with chess. Now, the challenges here are firstly that there's a lot of moves. There's over 300 moves. You could put stones anywhere on the board. Um, it's a 19 by 19 board, and you can play a stone at any of these intersections. The idea is to try and capture enemy territory by surrounding it. But the number of states, the number of possible board configurations is one of those things that's you know, bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. 
So there's no way you can just learn a value function for something like this. And all the traditional game playing techniques in AI, like um, search trees and so on, couldn't handle this because it was too complicated. But also, unlike the video games we spoke about before, it's adversarial. You're playing against an opponent that's learning as you go. All right, he's adapting to what you do. Now, this was considered to be the grand challenge of artificial intelligence, but as is quite commonly known now, in about 2016, um, a version of the same kind of algorithm beat one of the grandmasters, one of the best players that's ever played this game. And he's apparently subsequently retired from the game. There's a very nice documentary about this that I recommend watching about the algorithm and its development. But this was a big breakthrough. The idea that you can use the same kind of techniques, you can do this kind of reinforcement learning combined with convolutional networks, looking at the board, doing some simulations and so on to actually play against an expert. And what was interesting here is this was trained by um, watching millions of games that humans had played online. There was a lot of specialist knowledge they built into it. Um, but actually in later versions out of DeepMind, the same team, um, they, they built versions that didn't require any human knowledge and could learn by themselves. So just playing against itself for millions and millions of games, it could learn to play this game um, to beat pretty much any player and even earlier versions of the same algorithm, which is really interesting. Um, <clears throat> what was also interesting is again, because of the way they coded the reward function, um, the idea was that it got rewarded for a win and a negative reward for a loss, um, it actually ended up coming up with different strategies. And the reason is that people are very bad at evaluating their probability of winning. And so what they use as a proxy is the amount of territory of their opponent that they've captured on the board. But actually that's not right. So a human tries to think of like, I've got a high probability of winning if I could win by a bigger margin. But your algorithm isn't trying to do that. It's not trying to win by a big margin. It would rather win by one point, but have a higher probability of doing that. And so its strategies are slightly different. And people have actually learned from the strategies that have come out of this. And at this point, I like to think, you know, for a game that's got 361 moves, there's more possible states than atoms in the universe, you're playing against an opponent, how complex are the real world decisions that we make every day? When we're deciding everything from um, what restaurant do we want to eat at or what do we want to make for lunch to which route should we take to go to university or go to work um, to even some of our career choices. How complex are those compared to these kinds of games? Just a thing to think about. We can't simulate all of that, but it's similar kind of ideas. So having tackled the game of Go, then the, the challenge moved to more complicated things. So this is StarCraft. It's a game from Blizzard Entertainment. And this is what's called a real-time strategy game. You play in this fantasy world or the science fiction world. Um, you play as one of a number of alien races against a number of opponents. And, and you've got a few things you have to do here. You've got to build a base, um, which involves doing like building like units that can do construction. You've got to mine resources. You've got to build defenses. You've got to build armies. You've got to explore the world and then attack your opponents. Um, bases and so on. Now, this is still an open problem, but already versions of the same algorithms can beat professional players at this game. There's obviously caveats. They can't do it with in kind of the general setting, but this is the kind of problem that a lot of people are working on now. And the idea is here, you've got these continuous actions, these hugely high dimensional action spaces. Um, you're going to manage resources and your economy and your military and so on. You've got your, your inputs or the pixels from your screen. Um, and from that, your agent has to learn to play in these complicated settings. So if we look at kind of the history of the, the complexity of these kinds of games. We've gone from some of the Atari games um, where you had near perfect information. There were single player games, small action spaces, small numbers of moves through to Go, which then became multiplayer, bigger number of actions, slightly longer games to these StarCraft type problems that are multiplayer. There's ridiculously high numbers of actions. The states are uncountable. Um, the games are considerably longer. And this is the progress of how these algorithms are, are progressing. But also, you can use the same kinds of things in robotics. So 
for example, I just want to show you what you can do with some of these techniques. Now, in robotics, this is harder. You can't play millions and millions of games, but you can use the same ideas combined with neural networks as shown here. Um, there's convolutions, there's fully connected layers. Um, you can take things like the, the joint angles of the robot arm, like what it's seeing in the camera, and you can use the same techniques to solve a whole lot of different problems, which I'll show you here. So the idea is what we can do is learn by trial and error some of the basic principles of robot motion. Now, this is really interesting because, again, we can do this now in a way that interacts with the physical world. So, you know, maybe these aren't particularly interesting tasks, but these are difficult things. Getting a robot to hang things up on a railing, you've got different distractors. So the world looks slightly different each time and not fully general, but there's different shirts and things in the way each time. But these are quite complex tasks. There's a lot of precision required. And this has all been learned from trial and error learning. Right, so it's basically taking the pixels that it sees, and you can see there's a bit of variation in the world. It's taking the joint angles of its arm, and it's learning how to solve these tasks. And again, the same um, is learning in each case. So again, you can see here there's other distractors, but because of the way the function approximation, it can still learn um, to execute in these cases. And you can see here that the tasks are pretty varied in the way that they work. This is a very different kind of task to hanging a hanger on a hook. Right, and so where with robots, we went from an era of kind of trying to fully code things. Now with a very sophisticated robot like this with a very complicated environment around it, it can learn to solve the tasks we care about. This is still expensive. This still takes a lot of time and a lot of training samples which is where a lot of the research is at the moment, trying to reduce the complexity of this kind of learning. But these are really encouraging results. So this is where a lot of the current, <clears throat> current research in robotics is headed. OK, so now I've spoken a lot about these techniques, how they work, um, how we use them in video games, how we use them in robotics. But are these ideas actually used in practice? I mean, and to me, this is another very interesting area of current research is to try and take these techniques that are typically built in these settings that require you to collect millions of samples to learn and actually apply them to real world problems. So first off, there's quite a few places that they've been used already. And I'll go through some of them here. So one idea is um, in controlling traffic lights. And this is done a fair bit. So you want to synchronize different traffic lights in a city based on traffic, based on time of day and so on. And people have used reinforcement learning to do this. Right? You can learn these kind of optimal coordination problems between multiple traffic lights. One of the biggest areas um, where RL is used, and particularly the bandit problem, is in online advertising. So deciding which adverts to show you, um, in YouTube, deciding what the best next videos to suggest. This is done in a bandit style way. So for a certain user, can you kind of handle this trade-off between exploration and exploitation to decide what to show them next? So these algorithms are used a lot in this kind of context. Now famously, Google have used um, reinforcement learning to control the cooling in the data centers. So as you can imagine, Google have these huge data centers all over the place. And because they have to keep all their servers cold, this is hugely expensive um, to, to run. And so using reinforcement learning, they've been able to learn better cooling schedules that have saved their costs on this dramatically. I think this is an important application of how things like power management can be controlled with reinforcement learning. And finally, there's been a lot of work, <clears throat> most famously recently in AlphaFold, um, on learning things in like computational chemistry, learning about how proteins fold and so on. So this is a big area because we can simulate a lot of these interactions, we can try them, and we can run a large number of samples to try and learn um, from data what the best policy would be in a certain case. But moving forward, there's a lot of areas people are looking at at the moment. So one of them is manufacturing. Obviously, we looked at the robotics case. But traditionally, in, if you had a big robot factory, you had to, and you wanted to change the 
the product. So let's say you were producing cars, you wanted to change the cars you were producing. You typically have to take your factory offline for quite a long period of time while the engineers go and reconfigure everything and program exactly the coordinates your robot should be moving to. Um, with reinforcement learning, you can learn these things. And more interestingly, you can even learn to operate alongside humans. You can learn if a human's doing this, I should do this. You can adapt your policies as the people change, as they get tired and so on. So this is giving us this new era of flexible manufacturing, which isn't so much your large, large scale setting of a huge factory with huge robots. You can now look more at having a small workspace. Maybe there's a a human working alongside a robot, you know, very much the Iron Man type situation where your robots are learning from the human, they're collaborating and so on. And these are the kinds of learning techniques you want to use in those situations. I mentioned autonomous driving earlier. This is being reinforcement learning is being used a lot in this context. Again, you've got a lot of rich data. You've got the vision from your camera. You might have laser sensors. You might be paying attention to the driver and if they're paying attention and from all this information you're trying to learn behaviors and this might be a whole behavior to drive you somewhere or it could be smaller behaviors like lane changing behaviors and so on but reinforcement learning is one of the big techniques used in this area logistics is another area you want to optimize how to move your products around between different countries you might have different options of trucks and planes and boats um, there might be different costs associated with different forms of transport. Um, and maybe, you know, your traditional way of doing this would be to kind of hand code this or solve it given a set of known costs and known transit times. But these will vary all the time, conditions change. And if you want this to keep changing, reinforcement learning is the right way to do it. So you can think about, can I keep on the fly updating my policies for how best to move products around? Um, you, you can learn from a number of different samples. You could have simulations, but also every time you deliver a parcel or something, that gives you more data. And so you can keep updating the way you're doing this. So this is another prime area that people are applying reinforcement learning. Obviously, finance is a big place, particularly now because there's a lot of financial simulators. So choosing when to buy and sell and so on, exact same kind of problem. You've got a whole lot of state information, which could be you know, your costs of all your cryptocurrencies, you might be looking at including your state information, sentiment analysis from Twitter, and trying to make decisions of when do I buy and sell, how much do I buy and sell, how long do I hold things for, and so on. It's the same kind of problem that people are looking at. Interestingly, it's hard to find research on this, particularly because when people have successes, they tend to not publish it. One of the things I'm most excited about is healthcare. So we often use supervised learning. <clears throat> um, to look at certain healthcare problems, like can you look at a chest x-ray and tell what's wrong with the patient? But the RL problem lets us look at the whole temporal case. So you might have a patient with a chronic disease, and maybe they're coming into your clinic every two weeks, and we've got to make decisions. Should we change their medication? Should we admit them? Should we do scans? Should we change their diet or exercise? And so on. Um, you could even have someone in a hospital. You've got to decide you know, when do I put them on or off a ventilator? When do I change medications? Do I need another doctor's advice? Again, this is the reinforcement learning problem. We're trying to make a series of decisions over the long term where we just care about maybe the final output is we want this person to be healthy or we want to discharge them with the lowest probability of them returning to hospital in the next six months or something. And this is a difficult problem because it's hard to simulate and you can't really do exploration. You can't say, well, let me give this person 12 kilograms of painkillers. Oh, wait, that was bad for the patient. Let's not do that again. You can't take those risks. So there's a lot of work in reinforcement learning around exploring safely and injecting um, expert knowledge to make it easier to learn in these cases. And finally, I think there's also questions we could ask about business strategy. So if you can think about what should I do in my business? When should I grow, hire people, um, find new um like customers changing my marketing campaign you could look at this over a long series of time again this is a difficult problem because it's hard to simulate and it's hard to run samples of this but i think where we're moving now you could even start asking reinforcement learning to make some of your business decisions and potentially even decisions at like a countrywide level it'd be great if we can automate some of the ways we do reasoning about government strategy as well 
And I think this is going to be an exciting area in the next 10, 20 years of seeing how we can apply reinforcement learning to these really critical problems um, to make some really high impactful decisions um, in an optimal way. So what I've been talking about the whole time comes back to this idea of what I like to call the decision cycle. So for anything where you need to make decisions, there's a cycle you go through. You have to observe some phenomenon. You've got to make predictions of what's going to happen in the future. And based on that, you're going to intervene or you're going to make some decisions. So we're going to see what's happening in the markets. We're going to predict what's going to happen in the future. And then we make action. We take actions depending on that. And where a lot of machine learning is at, at the moment is we automate observations and predictions. We're very good at that, but the, the actions are taking, taken by humans. We get this kind of cycle here. But the problem is that humans are not good at making decisions. I've spoken a bit about how we're bad at long-term decision-making, trading off different costs and being optimal. And so what this is really looking at is can we optimize the entire cycle and do it in an automated way? And that question is reinforcement learning. So with that, I want to thank you for listening. This is a, a bit of an outdated picture of my research lab um, because we haven't been able to be on campus for the last year and a half now. But yes, if, if you're interested in this stuff, please look us up online, see some of the papers and projects we're working on and give us a shout. And I hope that was interesting. <laughs>